Playing the Ancient Baldur's Gate 2 for my last video, I was shocked at how poorly designed many of the environments, quests and puzzles were. There's backtracking through entire levels now filled with nothing but dead enemies and empty chests. You'll carry side quest related items from the starting dungeon until you need them maybe 20 hours into the game. The main city has item shops annoyingly scattered around different places, NPCs everywhere, and some of its best quests and recruitable party members can be missed completely. In short, everything is a horrible, ugly, inconvenient mess, which is exactly why I loved it so damn much. Real cities are horrible, ugly messes too. They weren't designed to support a specific hero's journey. They often weren't designed at all, but grew organically. New things built on top of old. People and problems placed everywhere at random. It's because of its mess that Baldur's Gate 2 feels so real, like a place you could just walk into. The place I just walked into is a tavern in the slums, and this lady walking up to me is Nalia. We'll follow her side quest from start to finish. She explains that her family's estate is under siege and she's willing to join the party in exchange for your help. This is presented as a choice, but judging from the blind let's plays I watched, sadly there was only three that qualified, every single player takes her on. I took her on to fill a role in my party, safe in the knowledge that I could do my other quests first and get around to hers if I ever felt like it. But after a few days, she delivered me this ultimatum. Please, you did promise. I need to go to my family's land and join in the defense. I am sorry, but I can't wait for you any longer. This is massively inconvenient for the player. Either lose your only mage slash thief, or put your own plans on hold and do as she requests. It's not just Nalia. Other characters will leave if they don't agree with your actions. They follow their own motivations, and so feel like real, believable characters. In so many other games, characters seem guided by Asimov's three rules of party character robots, where rule one is never inconvenience the player, never have a mind of your own, never be a real person. But this is all before the quest even begins. I got to the estate to find the troll besiegers had breached the defences and occupied the castle. So I snuck in through a secret door, then found the butler who told me about the ravenous monsters in the basement, and how he had to feed them four whole dogs. I found one third of a magical flower you can assemble. I found some trolls and slaughtered them like dogs, then got on with trying to get down to the basement and reclaim the estate. I did an optional quest goal, going out to the courtyard to open the drawbridge and let a little help in. Exploring a little, I found exactly four dogs. Aha! Uh -huh. I slaughtered them like dogs and got four meats for later. Despite two of the Let's Players realising the earlier hint... So I'm guessing I could, um... kill the dogs and use them for food to feed whatever the thing that guy was talking about. Only one killed the dogs, and that was by AoE accident. More on this later, but for now, the only lesson is that I'm a heartless monster. <laughs> Back inside, with seemingly no way to access the basement, I headed up to the second floor. After some exploration and some fights, I gained a key which unlocked some castle doors, including this set of stairs. I went to see where it went. It went through two boring lizard men and then straight to a dead end. Nobody reacted well to it. Okay then, this goes nowhere. So we just pop out here, kill two snake men, and go back inside, huh? Alright. This is something that happens a couple of times in different parts of the castle. Because it is a castle, first and foremost. It's not a fun house with surprises and candy behind every door. It wasn't just waiting for you to come along and give it meaning. It had a reason for existing before you got here. So it has some boring rooms full of beds and not much else, because that's what castles have. And that's why it feels like a real place. This world building comes at the player's expense, but I didn't mind paying the price. Moving on, I found Nalia's annoying, pompous, stuck-up auntie and decided to murder her for talking down her nose at me. Wow, okay. That was a huge hit to my reputation and Boo was quite upset at me. Nalia too. It was looking like mutiny. I will not tolerate actions such as this. We should strive to be just and fair. Remember, characters who disagree with your actions will abandon you. So I uh, cheated and reloaded. 
Damn, if only there was a way to stick it to her instead of through her. Wait, there is. Not presented to you in a dialogue list as a multiple choice question, mm. but the always available non-lethal fist of petty revenge plus one. I know it was wrong to beat up an old lady for just being snooty, but it felt so good. And it was some role playing I came up with all on my own. Attacking or punching someone out is always an option in Baldur's Gate 2. And you can do it to anyone without the teleprompter giving you the okay first. Giving you complete control of your character's aggression increases your immersion in the world. Importantly, the game doesn't stop you from doing things, even when they're a bad idea. The policing of your behaviour comes from in-world characters and events. You must gather your party before venturing forth. Okay, so not all the time. But what stopped me from murdering this lady was not game systems, but the consequences of my actions. Anyways, upgrading assault to mugging, I used my thief skills to pinch her necklace and moved on. Nearby I found the second flail part and the entrance to the basement. Before going down I noticed there was a whole area I couldn't access. But my metroidvania sense told me I'd probably access a, a different way from a different floor. So I went down, battled some more trolls, some tough umber hulks. Then moved on to discover the umber hulk feeding cells the butler mentioned earlier. Here I could place the dog meat to avoid the tough umber hulks I just killed in that room back there. This puzzle looks broken, but it's not. It's just difficult. A sneaky thief or a cleric with a sanctuary spell can sneak past and place the meat. Actually, it's not raw meat, but stew. I also missed an earlier step in the first floor kitchen where you can make the stew. I screwed up twice, but it wasn't just me. I know it's an extremely small sample size, but none of the Let's Players used this solution, and some of them were stuck on the Umberhulk fight for a while. One of them figured it out, but didn't have the resources. Yes. Crud. I know I was supposed to do something with food and such, but I don't have food. So... Yes? Let's prepare for this fight. Placing the dogs on the critical path and the feeding cells before the fight would have avoided all this. Most people would have found the solution, but they wouldn't have really earned it. And crucially, it would feel more like a video game dungeon puzzle designed for your success than a tough situation your party of adventurers have to deal with. And deal with it, we did. Yeah, it was tough, and we were more bruised up now than we would have liked. However, this was not a complete failure, but a missed opportunity. Something rare in game puzzles. Often game puzzles gate progress until you solve them. But in this case, all players could carry on, accepting their mistake. Accepting that they didn't have to be perfect. I felt like a real person muddling my way through this place, and not some impossible someone who has all the solutions before the problems even arise. Shortly after, I found the final boss. Killed it. Saved Nali's estate and found the third and final piece of the magical flail. He didn't have it. I must have missed something again. So I went back to the second floor, to that black area that I had never entered. After standing around for a bit, my character noticed a secret door that had always been there. We met a hostile castle guard, Glacus, and Nala informs us he's being magically controlled by evil forces. Ah, so this is going to be the old chat and pass a charisma test, I thought briefly, before realising that that kind of RPG puzzle isn't part of any world, but part of a game's systems. It uses numbers to abstract role-playing instead of actually requiring you to play the role and think about what your character should do. This quest has been requiring me to think, so I hatched a plan. I knocked out the possessed Glacus with the fists of This is for your own good, plus two. It didn't snap him out of it like I hoped it would, but it gave me time to think. He's under a magic spell. A spell. Dispel! It's one of the hundreds of magic scrolls my mage has in that scroll case of hers, and it's for the explicit purpose of dispelling magical effects on a target. You deserve no less than a It was a solution I came up with using the items from the world and the skills of my party. It wasn't a suggestion from the developers presented to me in a dialogue box. And there wasn't a scroll of dispel just handed to me in the previous room telling me exactly what to do. It's possible to get to this point and not have any dispels available. 
It's possible to miss that this is a situation you can even do something about. I did my first time through the game many years ago, and only one of the blind let's plays found this solution. Ha ha! Nice. The other two cut Glacus down and moved on, accepting that there was nothing they could have done. But I felt like an absolute hero. Because we'd saved someone, and for the first time in many games it felt like I'd actually done it. Like I was a character improvising my way through the world, and not an actor following a script written for me by the developers. In fact, I'd broken from the script by not visiting this place before heading down to the basement and killing the head troll. His storyline broken, Glacus walks out taking the final flail head with him. I had to pickpocket it from him. Quest completed and flail assembled, it's time for me to leave. We exit the estate and Nalia says there's one more thing she needs my help with. Oh yeah, I know what time it is. Wait, Nalia wants me to be her landlord? But I finished all her stuff, isn't this the part where we kiss and fade to black? It wasn't meant to be. While there is romance in the game, only four of the 16 party characters will ever be into you. And if you say or do the wrong thing, those four will reject you. In a messy and more believable world, not everyone loves you. But that's why I love it. The world of Baldur's Gate 2 felt so real because of four things. Characters that act on their own motivations and desires, even against your wishes. Dead ends and empty rooms. Having to face the consequences of my actions and being able to fail. Four things that ruined my plans, wasted my time, pissed me off and were annoyingly difficult. Polishing these things out of the design would make things more streamlined and enjoyable moment to moment. But I would have had a lot less fun with the game. Because here's the thing. Party members that follow their own motivations are much better characters. Finding a few dead ends is how you really know you're exploring. When the world punishes your own bad choices, you feel like an actual part of it. And having failure be possible is the only way you can truly succeed. If you're new to the channel, I recommend this video that has similar themes. If you've already seen it, here's an article I wrote about how Mass Effect both does and doesn't do the things I talked about here. And special for patrons only, you can read my review of Baldur's Gate 2 played from a 2017 perspective. Thanks.